So just encourage you now to take a few deep breaths. Center yourselves in this time, in this place, in this moment. One of the things that we're doing in this series of talks is to draw near to our relationship with the earth. So I encourage you now to think about a place where you feel connected to the earth. Maybe it's somewhere at the ocean, maybe somewhere in the forest, maybe the area you grew up in, maybe a different landscape even than the one we are in here. Take yourself to that place in your mind for a moment and reflect on what in that place speaks to you, what in that place moves you, what in that place leads you to feel connected? And have just a moment of gratitude for what it is to feel connected to this fragile earth, our home. As we're thinking about the earth and the land, I want to acknowledge the land that we are on here in this place, in this church. Uh, this is land that is unceded land that was of the Lekwungen-speaking peoples. This was a very important area, actually. Um, for thousands of years, this was an area of cultural and spiritual traditions thriving, of trade thriving, and of a unique relationship with the land, the plant beings, and the animal beings. I want to recognize that relationship and those first peoples and how they cared for the land. And acknowledge that I come here as a settler, as a white settler in this place, and that I am seeking myself ways to live into reconciliation and our community here at St. George's together is seeking to live into reconciliation in a way that has integrity and um, that has real roots. And we give thanks in particular to the Songhees Nation who've walked closely with the Anglican Church and, and beginning to um, make our way into a true reconciliation. So I give thanks for um, all of those who lived on this land before us and for the ways they cared for it and maintained it. I'm going to offer a prayer. Holy One, we give thanks for our many blessings, for the beauty of this place, for the sea and the air and the land, for the plant beings and the animal beings for the rain that was showered upon us this day that helps new things to grow. As we gather to focus on how we can care for our earthly home, we ask for you to give us courage, to help us walk on a right path, and to help us be liberated from ways of living that destroy our earthly home. Amen. It's a great uh, privilege and pleasure for me to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Trevor Hancock, uh, quite recently retired from teaching at UVic, uh, where he was a professor and senior scholar in the School of Public Health and Social Policy. For four years, he led a Canadian Public Health Association work group that resulted in a comprehensive discussion paper on the ecological determinants of health. He also co-founded the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment and the Canadian Coalition for Green Health Care. And in the 1980s, he was the first leader of the Green Party, both in Canada and in Ontario. He's been a national and global leader in the Healthy Cities and Communities Movement since the mid-1980s, is the Vice President of the Board of BC Healthy Communities, 
and leads the Greater Victoria Conservations for a One Planet Region. He also writes, has written a weekly column for the Times Colonist since uh, 2014. And he's here with us this evening to remind us of the fact that we don't have three to five Earths, even though we perhaps are living as if we do. We only have one Earth. He's going to help us become aware of that reality. And he's also, I think, going to speak to us about how we can truly live as if we have one Earth. So without further ado, I ask for you to join with me in welcoming Dr. Hancock. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Um, one of the things that I'm interested in with respect to this topic and with the work I'll come to talk about towards the end about conversations for a one planet region, what we're really having to look at is cultural evolution. We are going to have to evolve culturally from where we are now, which as will become apparent if you don't already know it, is really not working in many ways to a state in which it does work. And if we're going to shift our culture dramatically, which is what we have to do, we have to shift our values, which underlie or are rooted in that culture. And I see faith communities as key value holders in society. And so if we're going to change societal values, faith communities can and, in my view, must play a significant role, all faith communities. And so I'm always happy to have a chance to talk with different faith communities about this issue because you need to not only be on board, but you actually need to be in the vanguard on this issue. So, with that as a bit of a preamble, how many people here have heard of the Anthropocene? Okay, well, it's on the poster, so you should have. <laughs> uh, how many people here have some understanding of what the Anthropocene is? Okay, so for some of you, this will be a bit of a reprise. So, this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the fact that talk about the Anthropocene. I'm going to talk about the fact that we are the Anthropos in the Anthropocene. The Anthropos is us. And we may be the Anthropos, but who is we in this context? Not every human being is contributing to this problem equally or suffering from it equally, for that matter. Uh, secondly, I want to talk about thinking globally but acting locally, an old slogan but still a good one. Um, and apply that very much in the context of what we're doing here and the work of One Planet Saanich, which some of you, if you were here yesterday, will have heard about from Dennis Verhulst. Uh, so I hope I won't repeat a lot of what she said. And then I want to end by talking about hope, vision, and exciting opportunities, because the first part of this is a bit doom and gloomy, but we need to think past the doom and gloom, and to, particularly if you're talking with young people, they know what's going on and that's why they're out on climate strike next week. Um, so, but, but they need to be able to see where's the hope, where's the opportunity. Uh, feeding them a whole lot of bad news with no hope or no opportunity is, is a recipe for disaster. So I want to end by talking about that. So basically, what the Anthropocene is about, as I see it, is that our efforts to subdue nature have been so successful that we will show up in the geologic record which is pretty significant when you think about it. So I want to start with a short video. This is the story of how one species changed a planet. The latest chapter of our story begins in England 250 years ago. Fueled by coal, then oil, several brilliant inventions appeared. They ignited the Industrial Revolution, which spread like wildfire through Europe, North America, Japan, then elsewhere. The great railways, then cars and highways, connected people across the globe. Medical discoveries saved millions of lives. New artificial fertilizers meant we could feed more people. Population rose rapidly. But this was nothing compared with what was to come. The 1950s marked the beginning of the Great Acceleration. 
globalization, marketing, tourism, and huge investments helped fuel enormous growth. People swarmed to cities, which became even more powerful engines of creativity. In a single lifetime, the well-being of millions has improved beyond measure. Health, wealth, security, longevity, never have so many had so much. Yet one billion are malnourished. In a single lifetime, we have grown into a phenomenal global force. We move more sediment and rock annually than all natural processes, such as erosion and rivers. We manage three quarters of all land outside the ice sheets. Greenhouse gas levels this high have not been seen for over one million years. Temperatures are increasing. We have made a hole in the ozone layer. We are losing biodiversity. Many of the world's deltas are sinking due to damming, mining and other causes. Sea level is rising. Ocean acidification is a real threat. We are altering Earth's natural cycles. We have entered the Anthropocene, a new geological epoch dominated by humanity. This relentless pressure on our planet risks unprecedented destabilization. But our creativity, energy and industry offer hope. We have shaped our past. We are shaping our present. We can shape our future. You and I are part of this story. We are the first generation to realize this new responsibility. As the population grows to 9 billion, we must find a safe operating space for humanity, for the sake of future generations. Welcome to the Anthropocene. I just want to stop it there for a moment just to point out that this conference in London seven years ago now was sponsored by the Global International Geosphere Biosphere Program, the World Climate Research Program, the International uh, Human Development Partnership, Earth System Science Partnership, International Council of Scientific Unions. This is very high level global scientific bodies coming together in this conference. Um, and, and it's a, as good a depiction as I know of, of the challenges we face. So, I think what's important is to understand that there are three different aspects to the Anthropocene, and I'm going to talk about all three. The first is that it's a geological phenomenon, that, it, that actually the trigger for all of this is a group of Earth scientists called the International Stratigraphic Commission, that are looking at the evidence that this is a new geological epoch and that is based on evidence of a new geologic stratum, hence stratigraphic. Secondly, it is an ecological phenomenon. That geographic stratum that we are laying down, that is us, if you like, is a reflection of the massive global and rapid global ecological changes that we are triggered triggering, and of course that is the third part of the concept of the Anthropocene, which is, it's a human phenomenon, that it's, it's us, we are, and it says there, some of us in particular are the Anthropocene, and so the some of us being high income populations, whether it's countries or individuals. So, let me just start with the geologic. This is from a paper by the vice chair of the Anthropocene Working Group of the International Stratigraphic Commission as they were preparing the evidence to present that this was indeed a new geologic er uh, epoch. And these are some of the things that he says, or his work group says, we are laying down that are new geological, they didn't exist until we came along. And so things like 
pure aluminum, tungsten carbide, glass, plastic, concrete, didn't ex don't exist in nature. If you find them in a geologic layer, that's a marker of us, of our presence, and, you're f and you can find them everywhere. Um, certain chemicals, so not that CO2 is new, but the levels of CO2 you will have heard in that video, levels uh, that high, as high as they are now, have not been seen in a million years. Um, so you can see the changes in CO2 levels. You can see the changes in nitrogen levels. Um, you can find persistent organic pollutants, which are chemicals we have made that, as their name suggests, are persistent. And, of course, radioactive particles that we have created that didn't exist before since we started testing atomic bombs and, and creating nuclear fission products. And then I think, in some ways, the most troubling is this final point about changes in fossil assemblages, that humans are now one-third of by mass of all land vertebrates, and our domestic species make up, domesticated species make up almost all the rest. And only 5% of all land vertebrates are now composed of wild species. So paleontologists will see a very marked shift in the fossil record just as we saw a very marked shift when the dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago. So these are the scale of the changes that we are making in the Earth. And in fact, in May of this year, the Anthropocene Work Group voted 88% in favor of treating, in their words, the Anthropocene as a formal chronostratigraphic unit with the base around the mid-20th century of the Common Era. Put into plain language, Yes, there is a new geologic layer, and it, we can date its beginning approximately to the mid-20th century, so the uh, 1950s. And if you recall in that video, they talked about the great acceleration that began in the 1950s. The second point I want to make about the Anthropocene is it's much more than just climate change. So we tend to focus a lot at the moment on climate change, and it's, it's a big election issue, and it's everywhere. But climate change is only one part of the ecological changes that make up the Anthropocene. And the others include things such as ocean acidification as a result of fossil fuel combustion and CO2 emissions, uh, ozone layer depletion, which is the only piece of good news in this whole story, really. We actually did stop that and are reversing it, although it's still... There is still a quote-unquote hole, actually a thinning in the ozone layer. Resource depletion, depletion of, uh, I often think of them as the Fs. So fisheries, forests, fresh water, farmlands, fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are a finite resource. When they're gone, they're gone. It takes millions of years to create fossil fuels. We burn them in a few hundred years, and they're gone forever, in effect. They're not coming back. So those are all... Um, non-renewable or renewable resources that we are using at a rate that will deplete them. And then pollution and this word here, ecotoxicity. Ecotoxicity is the phenomenon that every one of us in this room and everyone out there carries a body burden of persistent organic pollutants. Um, dioxins, furans, PCB, DDT, whole bunch of nasties, in very, very tiny levels, but biologically significant. Um, and also, the bigger problem is we carry dozens of them, not just one or two. And you're born these days with a body burden of persistent organic pollutants, and we have no idea what the health implications of that are. But I don't know of anyone who thinks that it's not a problem, really, if you push them hard enough. So that's ecotoxicity. And of course, it's not just us, all those other species out there we are at the top of food chains, which makes us particularly susceptible, but so are the orca. So are bald eagles. We almost lost bald eagles and peregrine falcons and so on because of accumulation of DDT. It bioaccumulates up the food chain, and at the top of the food chain, you get a much, much bigger dose. So, for example, um, a, there's a, a chart from the um, International Joint Commission uh, from donkeys years ago now of the level of CO2 in the water compared to the level of CO2 as it builds up through the trophic system to the seals. And it's about an 86 million-fold concentration between 
the level in the water and the level in the seals. So that's what bioconcentration is. And of course, we sit at the top of food chains too. So that makes us susceptible. And then there's species extinctions. And species extinctions actually are in part from many of these things. So when you start to acidify the ocean, you're threatening calcareous uh, um, species. You're threatening coral reefs, which are major nurseries for the oceans, uh, and so on. Uh, all of these things potentially harm species. And then, of course, we are also destroying habitat left, right, and center. So species extinctions. We have started a sixth great extinction. The last one was the dinosaurs. There were four before that. And they're all happening at the same time. So this is the full picture of the Anthropocene. So yes, climate change is important, but it's much more than climate change. And it's all of this together. And it's all happening now, and it's all happening very rapidly. Naomi Klein, she just actually brought a new book out yesterday about the Green New Deal, or the day before. But Naomi Klein, a few years ago, brought out a book. This changes everything she wrote. And that was about just climate change. Well, actually, it's this that changes everything. So what we've got here are four key indicators of these global ecological changes. This is the ecological footprint. So here, this is the Earth's biocapacity. And this, globally, is where we sit, at about 1.7 Earths in terms of our use of biocapacity. Note that this is carbon, about half or more of it, a bit more than one planet's worth now, is carbon. But again, it's not only carbon. Uh, this over here is the Living Planet Index. It's a measure of population count of about 14,000 different species that have been tracked for uh, populations of species that have been tracked for many uh, years and decades. And since 1970, it's declined 60%. Uh, depending on where you are in the world, in some places it's declined much more than that. Uh, and for some categories, so it's looked at in terms of terrestrial, marine, and freshwater ecosystems. Freshwater ecosystems, I think globally, the decline is something like 80% in the last 40 years or so. This is planetary boundaries. So um, a group, the... the, and the um, uh, Stockholm Resilience Center, which has done a lot of the work around the Anthropocene and mapping it and so on, these two come from them. Planetary boundaries, they've tried to figure out what are the boundaries we should not transgress. So climate change, for example, which is over here somewhere, uh, here. So this is the sort of uh, two degree boundary. And so you don't want to transgress two degrees. And you can do a similar sort of calculation for a number of other key Earth systems. Um, in some cases, we have no idea what the boundary should be. Novel entities includes all of those persistent organic pollutants. It also includes um, uh, microplastics, you know, the microbeads and so on, nanoparticles, uh, um, GMOs, things like that. We have no idea what the boundary for that should be, how much is too much. We do for phosphorus and nitrogen, and we're well past it. We're um, approaching the limits for land system change. We're only in, a, uh, and we're approaching it now for ocean acidification. So we're in trouble on a number of Earth systems. And then this, this is the great acceleration. So what you can see here, this is nine different Earth systems, mainly the same ones as here, not entirely. And this line on each graph is 1950. And you can see that for many, but not all of them, it kicks up after about 1950. This is why the Anthropocene Working Group is saying the beginning of the Anthropocene is around 1950, uh, in that post-World War economic boom. And so carbon dioxide kicked up, nitrous oxide, methane, ocean acidification, surface temperature, stratospheric ozone, and so on, marine fish capture, shrimp, um, Tropical forest loss and domesticated land have not kicked up as much, but that's mainly because we'd already done a lot of damage before 1950, and we'd already domesticated much of the land before 1950. So those are some of the... So all of that's happening. This is what changes everything. So it's both the scale and the rapidity of this change that matters. And uh, I'm not going to go through these because I went through them on, on the small screen, but 
it's worth pointing out humanity's ecological footprint has increased about 190%, almost doubled since 1961. Whereas the biocapacity has increased. It's increasing partly because of fertilizers, partly because of warming temperatures. So it has gone up, but nowhere near as much as our demands upon it. This is the same thing. It's actually 16,000 species, not 14,000. Of, of populations, rather, 4,000 species. Uh, this is the planetary boundaries. Uh, what this is is um, gen gen um, ecosystem uh, diversity, uh, which is uh, extinctions, sorry, per million species years. And we're well above the red line on that one, too. Um, and this is what I just showed you, the great acceleration in terms of Earth systems. Now, all of that is due to the third part. So those, we've had the geologic aspects, the layer. We've had the ecological aspects, the global ecological changes. We now come to what's driving all of that, which of course is us. And so this is the Anthropos in the Anthropocene. Simple way to think about it um, that uh, was, um, oh, Paul, what's his name? Yeah, come. Hmm? Paul Ehrlich, some back in the 60s, I think, uh, came up with this, um, he and a couple of colleagues. Uh, it's very simple and uh, it's simplistic in some ways, but it's a very easy way to understand what's going on. And there are three forces. There's the size of the population, sorry, the impact is the size of the population, our level of affluence and the power of our technology. And all three are increasing. And so down here, this is a, a, a it's not math, mathematically precise, it's a, but it gives you a sense. This is roughly what things were in terms of the impact of all three of those in 1900, in 1950, and now today, or 2011. So there's been this massive acceleration across all three of these fairly crude indicators. This is some of the socioeconomic trends that are driving it, and again, on each of these charts, the dotted line is 1950. So look what's happened to international tourism. Look what's happened to telecommunications. Look what's happened to large dams, urban population, fertilizer consumption. This is what they call the Great Acceleration. And that's the problem and the impact of that. So one of the problems we have is that people, we, we talk about 3% growth. Reasonable economic target. Everyone would like to see Canada growth, GDP growth, I don't know, 1, 2, 3%. We don't take into account the doubling time and the impact of doubling. So in the report that we did for CPHA, we did a very simple calculation. What would be the impact over an 80-year lifespan? So an infant born today with today's current average life expectancy, which is around 80, over their lifetime, what would this mean? We're currently growing a little um, over 1% in Canada. Um, we're aiming for, uh, generally people talk about, a 3% annual growth. Put those two together, you're looking at a 23-fold impact increase over the lifetime of that infant. Does anybody think the planet can sustain a 23-fold increase? So I actually can't remember if I got this slide in here, I may not, but um, there's a famous quote, and I keep having a blank on his name, I know it perfectly well, well Kenneth Boulding. Kenneth Boulding, a system scientist and a, among other things, former president of the American Economic Society, said anyone who thinks that indefinite growth in a finite planet is possible is either a madman or an economist. <laughs> um, and even if our technology became five times more efficient, which is there, there's a book out there called Five Times or Five X, suggesting that we could do that, and we probably could, we'd still be looking at a fourfold increase over that infant's lifetime. This is what's happened. I am the Anthropocene, not only because I was born in 1948, just at the beginning of it, but also because I'm an affluent white male. And so I am the Anthropocene in many ways. This is what's happened in my lifetime. Populations almost tripled, real GDPs increased 11-fold, urban population almost five times, primary energy used five times, and so on. 
That's what's happened in my lifetime. That's not sustainable. So that's the challenge we face. And of course, the impact on the Earth, you see here. So methane has actually gone up almost 60%. And a lot of this was only till about 2010 or 12. We're now in 2019, so it's actually more than we're seeing here. Marine fish capture's gone up. So this is the stuff you saw in those charts, but this is turned into what's happened in my lifetime. So, but although we may be the Anthropos in the Anthropocene, who is the we? So if you look at CO2 emissions historically, from 1850 to 2012, the USA was responsible for 22% and the EU for 18%. So historically, we've contributed 40% uh, of CO2 emissions. And then uh, other countries, China, Russia, India, and Brazil, uh, and so on. That will continue. By 2100, it, was, it is estimated that the USA and the EU will have contributed almost half of the temperature increase resulting from greenhouse gas emissions. So when we say we are the Anthropos, the we is very much the high-income countries, and also the model that we have sold to or imposed upon, depending on how you look at it, uh, or has been taken up by middle and low-income countries. Um, the poorest half of the global population, around 3.5 billion people, are only responsible for 10% of total global emissions, whereas 50% of the emissions can be attributed to the richest 10%. So if you talk about eco-justice, this is it at a global scale. And of course, the other piece of this is that not only who benefits, but who loses. And we know how that equation works. The well-off benefit and the poor lose. And it's the same in Canada, it's the same globally, it'll be the same in Victoria, actually. It's the same everywhere. So this is some of that inequity. So we saw earlier the ecological footprint. Now, I showed you global biocapacity going up, which it has, 27%, if you recall. But that's total. But the population has been growing over all that period. So actually, the average biocapacity per person has declined. So this is high-income countries. This is middle-income, and this is low-income in terms of ecological footprint. So if we want to live a one-planet lifestyle at the moment, it means living approximately where middle-income countries are right now or were in 2010. That's what a one-planet lifestyle would look like. So this is just putting all of that into, into text, and I'm not going to go through it um, in great detail. I want to focus on this final point. Clearly, high-income countries are getting, on average, about three and a half times their fair share. So our fair share of the planet is one planet's worth. Actually, Canada, this is an average for high-income countries, but Canada's ecological footprint is 4.75 planets. So we're taking way more than our fair share of the Earth's biocapacity and resources. And in fact, globally, high-income countries, we're taking on average three and a half times our fair share, because the Europeans take less than us. They're more efficient. This is, you remember earlier, the Living Planet Index, which declined about 60% since 1970, the species count, or the population counts. This, however, is what's happened with high-income countries and middle-income countries and low-income countries. We've actually increased our Living Planet Index, our populations of these species. Several reasons for that. We're wealthy enough that we can now put land aside, we spend money on protection, we try and save and reintroduce species, things like that. We did that for the eagles and, uh, and so on. We're not doing it very well for the orcas or the caribou. Um, but also possibly because we'd already inflicted a lot of damage in the 19th century and we're now recovering from that. But also because we're no longer exploiting our habitat and resources, we're exploiting other people's habitat and resources, and so they're taking the hit for us. 
So there's a whole bunch of issues wrapped up in this. It's a very interesting issue. So that's, that's the doom and gloom. When I talk about this as a physician, one way that I put this is it's like having a diagnosis of cancer. We don't believe that we shouldn't tell you. you know, don't tell auntie she's got cancer, it's a secret, we won't tell her. We don't do that. Generally we don't anyway. Um, I think it's the same with this. You have to face the situation, only then can you begin to deal with it. And, and the kids get this. They know perfectly well what's going on. Um, but then you have to also bring it back down to what can I do? Because this is a big global problem and I can't save the planet. Um, and I shouldn't try and take on that burden. And I tell people, and John and Anne know Franny, my wife, I used to think I could change the world, but after 20 or so years, and it's now 47, but after 20, the first 20 or so years, I realized I couldn't even change Franny. Why did I think I could change the world? So a little humility is quite handy when it comes to this. Um, but there's stuff you can do locally, even if you can't act. And we can't act globally, all of us. There are few special people can because they're in positions of power and influence and whatever. But most of us can't, but we can act locally. So I've already said this in essence, but in Canada we act as if we had this, as if we had five planets, just about. But of course we only have this, we know. So, what does that mean? It means we are going to have to reduce our ecological footprint by 80%. That's huge. That's so we only take our fair share. We're not going to get there overnight or even approximately over a decade or two, but that's where we have to be aiming to go. So you have to have a target. Here's a useful target. Our target should be to move to a place where we only consume our fair share of the planet's resources and, and biocapacity. And remember, nature needs its fair share too. So it's not that humans take it all and the caribou and the orca and the rest of them don't get anything. There has to be a fair share for nature too. Some people say that's 20-30%. But at the same time, and this is the I'm not sure it's necessarily the tricky part, but it's an important part of this. How do, you re how do we reduce our ecological footprint by 80%, but at the same time ensuring people have a good quality of life and that everyone has a good quality of life? In, let's say, in Greater Victoria. How do we make sure in this region that we reduce our footprint by 80% and still maintain a decent quality of life and do so for everyone? That's the challenge. So it's balancing the social and the ecological. So this is it. The, what I, this is really the grand challenge of our age. How do we live equitably, in harmony and in good health? I'm a physician, I always put the health piece in. Um, on this one small planet. So, one of the things that I've helped to get off the ground and is going quite nicely in a small way, is conversations for a one planet region. And we start with the, 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 pro, the problem is that we're not even discussing this. So we're, if we're talking about anything, we're talking about climate change. We're not talking about the whole package. So, we, so the conversations are exactly that. We simply want the conversation. This is a part of that. This is a kind of outreach oops, of our process of conversations. Our vision is that the Greater Victoria region achieves social and ecological sustainability. Note their social sustainability. We, we are accustomed to talking about sustainability in ecological terms. We have to think about social sustainability as well. Poverty and high levels of poverty are not socially sustainable. Ultimately, they can lead to revolution to rebellion because it becomes an unacceptable way of life for people. Uh, so social and ecological sustainability with a high quality of life and a long life and good health for all its citizens. Not some, 
Not a few, not even many, but all. And so our mission as a group, and there's a couple of folks here who are part of that group. I point specifically to Claire Atwell because Claire uh, is part of our planning group too. Um, our mission is simply to establish and maintain those conversations. And we've got a number of different ways that we're talking about of doing that. Having our monthly meetings is a piece of it. The problem with the monthly meetings is, frankly, it's the usual suspects in the room, which is not bad and is useful. And it's folks like us, if you look around this room, to much of our conversations. So how do we reach out demographically to much different demographics? How do we reach out geographically? So it's not all about sort of in the urban core here. Uh, those are some of the things we're talking about. So we're talking about how we expand and deepen this conversation. We're looking at live streaming our events. We've, these, are, uh, these are ideas. They're not things we're doing. We're just about to register as a society so we can start to go out and seek funding. To this point, we've had no funding. We've done everything we've done as the conversations for the last three years. Um, I'm lose that again. We've done everything we've done uh, with zero budget. And, and that's uh, uh, one of the uh, consequences. Well, actually, it's not really a consequence of that, but one of the points about the conversation is we only use local speakers and we don't pay them. And that is not just because we don't have budget and we can't bring them in. It's because we firmly believe that the knowledge and expertise we need to address this is right here in this region. We know enough. We have enough expertise. We have enough knowledge. We have enough capacity and resources. We just need to mobilize it. So we, we're making the point. It's already all here. We can do this. Um, we've talked about kitchen table conversations. So how do you get this kind of thing happening literally at the kitchen table or with your neighbors in a block watch, whatever? Uh, One Planet co-design charrettes. We're talking with the Oakland's community part of uh, the um, part of the, the city of Victoria uh, that has to revise its neighborhood plan and we may well be doing a charrette with them rather like the one that was done here at Cabra Bay in fact uh, but imagining what the Oaklands would look like if it was a one planet neighborhood uh, we've talked about people for a one planet region how do we train people and give them skills and resources so they can go to council and support the policies and plans and proposals that take us in the right direction and oppose those that take us in the wrong direction. So a sort of citizen de um, democracy, um, possibly create awards. Um, and then we have what we're calling spin-off projects. So we're not doing these, but they've sort of partly come out of our work. Um, so there's uh, plans to develop uh, some sessions in the fall at UVic for students in particular around eco uh, grief and climate anxiety. We're working with the uh, Community and Social Planning Council to look at the social justice implications of all of this and the employment Im implications. And they've just put in a proposal for funding to look at this. Um, we're working with folks like you, with faith organizations, as I said earlier, to explore the ethical and spiritual dimensions of all of this. Um, what does it mean to move from a position of dominion over the earth to stewardship of the earth, or partnership with the earth, or living within the earth, or however you want to frame that? Um, we've just started a conversation, and Claire is part of this, around art, nature, and place. How might we use and work through and with the arts to help people get a deeper connection to their sense of place that you talked about, uh, and a connection to nature? Um, and then we've got an ecological economics group that's linked to the folks doing the Green New Deal, looking at what kind of economy do we need for this? We need a very different sort of economy. So what would a one planet economy look like in this region? That takes some thought and work. And then there's one planet Saanich, which um, you uh, heard about yesterday, so I won't repeat all of this. Uh, it's part of a now a two year long project. It's just got funding for with several other communities organized through an organization called Bioregional. So this is our local ecological footprint. This is the work of uh, Jenny Moore from BCIT and Cora Holsworth, who I think is speaking here, isn't she? Hmm? No? Okay. 
Well, she's a consultant to um, uh, One Planet Saanich, works with One Earth. Um, and she and Jenny did the ecological footprint. This is based on household expenditure. So actually, it gives you a somewhat different answer and a different way of looking at it. But what they found is that if you look at our ecological footprint for Victoria and for Saanich, almost half of it is due to the food we eat. So we're going to have to switch away from our high meat diet to a low meat diet. Um, Transportation is another big chunk of it. Um, buildings are another big chunk, and then consumables. So these are four big sectors where we have to make important change. This morning, I keynoted a conference on healthy built environments. An important part of that conversation was about climate change and transportation, climate change and housing. How do we become a, uh, a zero carbon community? What do we have to change in terms of transportation, in terms of buildings? Not so much about food because it was about healthy built environments, but this conversation is happening everywhere now in various ways. These are the 10 principles that Bioregional has for One Planet Living. And what I like about this is that the first three principles are about us, about people. They bring the social into this. It's about health and happiness, equity and local economy, culture and community. Um, and then you get into the more sort of standard things we talk about in terms of one planet living and so on. Um, I'm not going to go through this in any detail. The key point here is that more than half, almost three quarters of the footprint due to food is actually due to meat, fish, eggs and dairy. That's why we have to switch away from a high meat, high dairy diet. Transportation, almost three quarters is due to private vehicles and buildings, almost three quarters is due to the operating energy to heat them and cool them and light them. So, so this is the, uh, some of the ecological footprint work. And of course, there are ways to reduce, and they recommend in their report, ways to reduce our footprint. Eliminate fossil fuel emissions in buildings. We could do that. It's entirely feasible. Convert half of gasoline private vehicles to electric. We've started that. Just need to keep pushing it. Reduce purchase of non-food consumables by 30%. Consume less, buy less, less stuff. One of the key messages in all of this is less stuff. Um, reduce meat and dairy by 25% and purchase 25% less food. Do you know how much food is lost in the food chain in Canada from farm to, um, well, past our tables? Uh, 50? 60, actually. Yeah. 60% of all food, if you take the whole chain from the farm, from the field onwards, uh, is wasted in one way or another. So, you know, if we, if, we consumed le if we bought less food, we might throw away less food. So these are some of the issues. The key point from my point of view, too, and one of the things that makes this attractive is there's health benefits or health co-benefits to all of this. So we can, you know, being more physically active in our transportation is good for us. It reduces obesity. It's good for our physical health. Eating a low meat diet is good for us in health terms. Um, getting away from fossil fuels is, reduces air pollution uh, locally. Uh, there's a whole bunch of health and other social co-benefits potentially in moving to this sort of community. So we need to be looking at not just all the bad news, but look at all the good news. If we went this way, this is how much better things could be. And we have to think about that. I'm not gonna go through these, uh, it's too much, but I just wanna end with this, that we need to be thinking in terms of hope and opportunity and vision. A colleague of mine, Monica Dutt and, and uh, her colleague said in an article, actually in the Times Colonist a few years ago, hope is the commitment to positivity in the face of adversity. We are in the face of adversity, we have to maintain positivity. We have to see how that can be turned to a good thing. Uh, my friend Clem Bezold at the Institute for Alternative Futures, vision is values projected into the future. So if you think about what your values are, you can project them into the future and that becomes your vision. Or if you can develop your vision, implicit in that vision is your underlying values. So vision and values are really important in all of this. And then, of course, Einstein, in the midst of every crisis, lies great opportunity. And there are great opportunities. Remember, this changes everything. All of this changes everything. So we're going to have to 
reinvent everything if this has to change everything. And in fact, it's, it's, it's to some extent us, but in, it very much the burden, unfortunately, is going to fall on the new generation and the next generation. They're going to have to reinvent everything. But the good news is we've got the science and the technology. That's not the barrier. We know how to do this. We've had it since the early 1970s. Most of what I'm talking about, not all of it, but most of it, we actually knew, at least in outline, in the early 1970s, at the time of the first UN conference on the environment in Stockholm. So we've known it for a long time. But that's also the bad news, because the problem is not ultimately a science and technology problem. It's a social and an economic and a political and a cultural and an ideological, philosophical, ethical and spiritual problem. That's social change. It's not science and technology that's going to save us. And so we need, and this is where the opportunity comes in, particularly for young people. I talked about this in a session for 150 high school students earlier in the summer, and they loved it. Because I said, you know, we need you. You need to be the new philosophers, the artists, the writers, the video and filmmakers, the faith communities, the scientists and the technologists who are going to reinvent our future. And that's a wonderfully exciting opportunity and challenge. And they loved it. I mean, they were kind of whooping and hollering by the end. We're going to need new green and social entrepreneurs who are going to create the new economy that we need. So there are a lot of potential opportunities in all of this. And that's, I think, where we have to put the focus. So while the Anthropocene poses daunting challenges, the One Planet region presents endless opportunities. And I will leave it at that. Thank you.